Okay, so astronomy is one of my inter interests. And so uh, back in May when there was four planets all closely grouped together in the eastern sky, um, I uh, used some simple equipment and made what I think is quite a, a fun uh, movie. And uh, what impressed me was just how simple and easy the whole thing was. So I've got a, I used a basic SLR for this uh, because I need the low light sensitivity and also it's helpful for managing the images if you've got, if I've got a fixed focal length lens rather than a zoom where you're not quite sure where it is and in terms of matching up successive fields and things like that. And then this really made it easy from, uh, everything was from eBay. Um, and this thing here, you just program it as to how long to, the interval between shots and how many shots and, and things like that. And it just runs pressing the shutter for you and all I had to do was to mind the camera. Because once you start the sequence, there's nothing to be done. And then I needed my software, which, so Stellarium. Now that's a, an open source astronomy uh, planetarium thing. Uh, Adobe Photoshop, now I run that under Wine. Um, and I'm, it's what I'm used to. Maybe GIMP can do what I need, but I don't know how. And then there was Image to Raw, which took the basic still frames that I, I captured and that was produced a suitable input to KDN Live which gave me an MPEG. And so this is the basis of the solar system um, as it was in early May with not to scale but we've got the Earth here and then we here we have Mercury Venus, Mars and Jupiter. So you can see how with a sight line they're all, they're all grouped nicely together and until sun rises and they, you lose them in the daylight. But this is what they really are, but in this case the orbits are to scale but the, the planets are at this scale. The, the planets are, are just pixels. And yes, th this gets you out as far as Jupiter. Saturn's a lot further out. Neptune's even further out. And then, so back in, in May, I'm down to the end of Blues Point Road uh, at 5 a.m. And which is, uh, well, the common park there that everyone might know and then I started taking photos and, th and that was the first one and then I took a few hundred more <laughs> right and uh, there they are and you, you can see there are three every minute when, and not having to do that myself was was really good and so I then wanted to make a title slide so that's a uh, as one of the frames from the middle of the sequence which has got Jupiter and then it's up here and Mercury, Venus, Mars but you can also see some other odd stars around the place and you'll see even more of those in the animation and so then I, in Stellarium, uh, bought up the, the time for that photo and that gives me this uh, geometry. Really fuzzy. Was it? Oh. Yes, yes. So 
So that let me steal the, the grid and the, the placements and everything. And then in Photoshop, I produced a composite by resizing them and overlaying them and putting in my text. And then this is the, the, uh, the Linux part um, with image to raw, which will produce a, a type of video file um, with maintaining the aspect ratio, two pass processing, giving me a long length for the, the title and 12 and a half frames a second to give me a 250 speed and that produced a 78 meg megabyte file and then KDN Live, which I'm sure I can get a lot more out of, produced a 6.3 megabyte file which was then suitable to put up on YouTube. And now let's go to the the result and this is the product. Let's do that again. <laughs> That's Jupiter. Mercury and then Venus below it. Mars has just come up. And sundry background stars. And even then, you still had Mars in the, that, uh, that you could pick up in the, um, in the dawn. Do you want that again? <laughs> And so we'll go back to the slideshow. No. And <laughs> so let's get to the. <laughs> why isn't it? I don't know why that's not coming up. But uh, that's up on YouTube. There's the, uh, the address there, or you can find it by searching for four planets and 250 times, um, which uh, finds it amongst all of the others, um, which uh, I don't think are anywhere near as good. <laughs> Thank you. Switching that one, plug it in there, that into a VGA port. I have one off. Excellent. I've done it before, not just not with this projector. You said something about. Did it do it itself or what? Yep, it's working. Okay. It looks like it's working. It's not coming through the recording. Can someone tell me how to change the resolution? Uh, there. Okay. My choice is 800 by 600 or 640 by 480. Uh, try 800 by 600. That's what it's on. Oh, yeah. oh that's what it's on? <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. Yep. And then make it. Yep. Cool. Is that all right? Yep. Now you just need to get your content over on the other monitor. Contents on different desktop. Yeah. Yeah. And 
I get the ah, okay. to the left of. So that one should be over there. That's uh, good. Just try dragging it across to the right. They should actually be in well, different be. different desktops. And <laughs> it doesn't. Right. I'll just look at that screen then. Okay. Um. I spent a day at Erina, going between Optus and uh, Virgin, actually trying to get my modem to switch. Uh, carriers um, Which way? from Virgin to Optus. Well, yes, they both use the Optus network, except Optus's plan, current plan, is cheaper than what I was on with Virgin. So, anyway, um, the two call centres were, although polite, rather unhelpful. <laughs> um, they did give me the unlock code. I had purchased enough of their internet for them to hand over the unlock code. And what they couldn't tell me was how to enter that into the modem. Um, they, of course, assumed I was using their software, which came on the modem. And the way that that's supposed to work is you plug in a different SIM, and it should ask you what the unlock code is. I'm not using that. And that's not in the call center script, apparently. So. I did a bit of research, and here are my findings. Um, firstly, it is doable. Okay, that's a good start. Um, I managed to stumble across the Huawei web page, which has the command in it. The command is at caret card lock. Okay, Google search for that will actually point you in the right direction. Um, from there. I'd already given the um, I'd already been given the unlock code, and I had to figure out how to put that in. The manual is pretty helpful, but the thing is, um, it wasn't really necessary to actually contact the carrier because it turns out that the unlock codes of the modems are a function of the IMA, and the IMA number is conveniently printed on the underside of the modem. So, um, yeah, it's really cool. So, demonstration on the next desktop. Use your favorite terminal, what is it, serial terminal emulator, and make sure you're not using the modem first. <laughs> Right, um, yeah, I can't demonstrate that. Terminal's not there. Um, if, if you're using Ubuntu or Network Manager in general, Network Manager will actually tell you which um, device you're using. It's that device that you need to connect to. So when you haven't, when you're not using it, open the modem and type AT caret card lock interesting yeah I've never actually gotten this to work first time ever <laughs> brilliant <laughs> oh, that came up on my screen Okay, I got no idea what's going on there. Any help, <laughs> audience? I was ty as typing and nothing was. Yeah. Ah, I've got no idea actually. So perhaps turning that down might help. Okay. <laughs> so, okay. 
<laughs> yeah, right, okay, brilliant. Okay. <laughs> yeah, okay. A, T, enter. A, T, I, enter. Nothing. Oh, there we go. It's just really slow. Okay. Why it's really slow, I don't know. Well, perhaps it's, there's, it's an audience. I'm nervous and it's noticed. <laughs> yeah. Um, what I'll do is I'll just kill Network Manager. Okay, so network manager's out of the way. I've unplugged it, I've plugged it back in. That is. Now let's see what we got. Yay! See, that's how fast it should have been. Brilliant. Okay, those three numbers. Does anybody know what they mean? <laughs> Great. Um, that was the most fun part. And I can't actually remember it myself. I'm going to have to read off that screen. It'll give you a format in X, Y, Z. Okay, X is a status. Um, one's locked to a different network. In other words, you can't use it with this SIM. Two is lo either locked to the same network or it's unlocked, which basically means you can use it with this SIM. And three means it's locked permanently and the manual has left what locked permanently means undefined. Yeah. 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 I had, well, this modem had 10 attempts and I needed only one of them, which is good. Um, the third network, sorry, Y is how many attempts you got remaining. So it actually is kind enough to tell you when it's going to lock you out. And the Z, the last number in those three is the operator code, which is the network that the modem is locked to. Um, I didn't actually ask what Optus or Virgin's network operator code is, although I probably should have. <laughs> Um, just so I can make more sense of what was going on. Um, once we have those three numbers and we've unlocked our modem, um, so you go AT, carrot, card, lock, uh, equals, and then put the number in. Is it? Um, is it? Yeah, equals unlock code. So AT carrot card lock equals, and then the unlock code in quotes. It's got to be in quotes, otherwise it's not valid. Um, if it, if the modem, if you try to unlock the, the modem and you put in something invalid here, it doesn't actually deduct any unlock attempts from you, which is really good. Although it doesn't, it won't actually unlock the modem either. Um, after that, you should probably query it again with AT carrot card lock question mark, and it should display two whatever unlock attempts you had that's no longer relevant, and zero meaning unlocked. As for the function, I'm not going to really go into detail with that here, um, but I found some Python code. And I found it easier to translate that to Perl. Um, what? what? 
<laughs> well, it's, <laughs> it's just that the web server I'm using is four years old and didn't support Python. <laughs> So is what's that one? No, not that one. That one. I have, of course I have. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> anyway, um, the way that script is supposed to work is y you put the IMA number in. And it'll run the two hash functions. All it is is MD5 with a couple of constants thrown in, a few iterations, and voila, you've got your flash code and your unlock code. <laughs> so that's pretty much it. I hope you find it useful. Um, any and all of you who have mobile broadband modems. Yeah? Yeah. Um, the no, no okay. I'll repeat the question. Uh, what's the the price that I? What's the offer Op Optus's offer with my mobile broadband plan uh, as opposed to Virgin's? Um, I use prepaid, um, and the Virgin plan I was on, I was on the lowest end Virgin plan, which was twenty dollars a month for a gig. Um, I actually switched to the highest end Optus plan which is uh, $130 for a year for 15 gigs. So it actually works out cheaper. Um, Virgin's comparable plan is $150 a month for uh, 13 gigs. So, sorry, $150 a year for 13 gigs. Did I, did I say a month with the Optus one? Uh, cool. <laughs> To, to ask Virgin, I was with Virgin to start with. Um, their unlocking deal, which I, th I assume changes from carrier to carrier, was simply that I recharge um, cumulatively to $80 credit. I think I was at something like 500-ish. So, <laughs> yeah. Yes? No, I didn't. But I end up, ended up with an unlocked modem at the end. Sure. <laughs> 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 For the Optus network, anyway. Well, yes. However, what happens if I want to switch again? Anyway, um, <laughs> any other questions? You'll be around during the break, so. Yeah. Uh, but you wouldn't want to switch to Telstra because whatever modem you got from Optus wouldn't support next year. Yeah. 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 Excellent. <coughs> Three, apparently. Really? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, oh, yes, they're coming on. I'm trying to get rid of the other ones. Now can we get the spots on again? Hey! We're trying to get the lights right so that the people on the video can see the speaker and you guys can see the screen. <laughs> okay. Yes, it's in my eyes. 
I can't see the room now. I hope you appreciate what I'm doing for you. I can see my reflection. And now we can see the ball behind you very well. <laughs> now, the question is, can the video see me? Because that's clearly what's most important. Yes. Excellent. Um, so Patrick decided for some reason that every time I talk, it's a talk called James Explains. But I've changed it for this month to James Declares because I've been playing around with a bunch of declarative languages lately. Um, de declarative languages are programming languages where you don't tell the computer how to do something. You tell it the result you're trying to achieve and you let the computer figure out what it needs to do for itself. Um, so one that I've been playing with is, as a bunch of people have noticed, um, a language called DOT, um, which is used for drawing graphs. I have no idea what DOT stands for. But just to give you a simple example, um, I've got a list of names here. Um, let's say this is a list of employees in a company, and you want to draw up an organizational tree. Now, you could pull out your fancy Photoshop or something and do lots of stuff with graphics and you know, make lots of rectangles and draw lots of lines and move lots of things around. But we have computers to do that for us. All we really should have to do is tell the computer, you know, this is the structure. You go draw. So let's start by adding in some information here about who manages who. Actually, before we even do that, let's make the simplest possible graph. And I save that, and that is this file here. And I have done something wrong. What's wrong with that? File exists. Vim doesn't want to write it because I haven't written to it before. There we go. Now graphers will open it up for me. So you can see, just by declaring, here's my list of employees. Graphis has already started the process by declaring nodes for each of those people. Um, if we go ahead and just add some information about who manages who. I write that. Not running Pico. Oh. <laughs> what? What have I done? Where did I write it to? Documents graph is basic dot dot. Yes. Oh, nope. I don't actually know what's wrong there. I'm not running VMware this week. Um, Let's just go ahead. Um, so we've got Charlie, let's say Charlie manages Eve. Input someone wrote a wrong file on Eve. Pardon? Input Carol wrote a wrong file. Yup. So Brianna. What the hell? It looks fine to me. Anyway, so let's cheat and switch one I prepared earlier. So you can see I've gone a little further here. Um, we've got not just information here about Adam manages Brianna, Brianna manages Eve, and so on. Um, we've also clustered some of these users together to say these people are in Sydney, these people are in Melbourne. And, but it's still, it's still a nice, simple, plain text, readable file. Um, just looking at the file, you can understand what's going on. 
Um, you haven't had to specify anything complicated about what connects to what. And if you open up that file in GraphBiz, this is the result. Um, say Charlie moves to Melbourne. We can just move his label down there. Reopen that file. And GraphBiz doesn't care. <laughs> <sighs> To what? Oh, right. I've heard of latex. I have to try that one day. There we go. I don't know why it's gone yellow. Ta-da! Excellent. So you can see you can make a simple change to the text, and Graphers handles handles the actual details of how to draw that for you. Uh, <coughs> This, this particular management relationship is special for some reason, so we're going to make it red, red line. Um, you can see how this is a useful way of um, taking, taking data that's in your head, and you can just be effectively jotting down notes about it, and you end up with something that the computer can actually draw to make something useful. Um, just yesterday, I had a problem at work where I was looking at a complex relationship of code that included other code and inherited from other places. And I was getting very confused about which code was pulling in which other code. So I just sat down and worked through the code in one window, made notes in the other window about this is including that, this is inheriting that. And at the end of it, I had this gigantic graph drawn by graph is for me, which was very helpful in figuring out how to move things around. So um, graph is, by the way, you can get from graphviz.org. I have a browser here somewhere. So to get this straight, dot is the dot is the language, the language that generates the graph is and the, yep. the graphics and graph is, is the program that you the is the program I'm using to view it there. Graph is is a very basic program. Um, it gives you that rendering, it gives you a few attributes you can control, but there's not a lot of control. Um, but because dot is such a simple language. There are plenty of other programs that support it. Um, if you have a look, there's, uh, if you're a Mac fan, there's things like OmniGraffle will let you actually do visual editing of the, the graph. Um, I think Xfig might let you edit them as well. So what does dot, what format does dot export to? Um, so dot itself is just a plain text format. Um, so that file I'm looking at there in Vim is the dot file. So that's what that graph is. Ah, okay. And then you open it. And yeah. And then I can open, and then from graphics, from graph viz, sorry, I can export it to all sorts of yeah. formats. Um, and because it's such a simple language, there are a bunch of uh, libraries that support it in different languages. Um, so I use a lot of Python, so I've been using uh, this program called PyDot. There is a much better... There's just a, a simple sample here. Um, if you know any Python, that's you know very simple. You declare a graph, you declare a couple of subgraphs, you declare a couple of nodes in the subgraphs, and that generates a nice picture for you. Um, so another thing I've used this for recently is generating an organizational tree at work, which we've never had one because it's just complex and there's interrelationships all over the place. But we have our HR data in a directory. So run some Python, go through the directory, add in the links, voila, you have a nice big org chart that's too big to be actual, actually useful. No, I didn't. I can't edit the titles. Anyway, that's James Declares for this month. Yes. Yep. Yep. So the the question was, what's the advantage of using something like this over using mind mapping software? Um, the only answer I can give is my mind tend to tends to work better in text. So I find it easier for me to just jot down notes 
and have something else turn it into a graph. Um, if you're the kind of person who, th who thinks better visually and needs to see the arrangements as you're making them, um, then mind mapping software is definitely better. But a mind map is a collection of nodes with joins between them. Um, so some mind mapping software, I think, can actually export to dot. And you can definitely take your dot file and convert it into a mind map. Yep, out of a mind map, yeah. Um, it's all based around the, the mathematical theory of a graph, where you have nodes, you have edges between them, which might have directions. Yeah. Um, is, have you found a decent reference on the, the dot language? Um, define decent. <laughs> um, the way I generally figure out how to do stuff in dot is open up a Python interactive shell and you know construct the graph I want in Python and then use pydot to dump that to a file and then read the file. <laughs> so no I haven't really found a good reference. Okay. Yep. So um, you can Dot could certainly help you with the, the beginnings of that. Um, it lets you express the relationships. Um, what it lacks that things like um, Visio will have is a nice library of you know, pictures of routers. Um, dot has a couple of basic shapes. You know, you've got a box, an ellipse, a circle. Um, but you know, router is not one of the shapes. That said, there is uh, Dot has a syntax for um, putting lots of information into a node. Um, it's a syntax that's very similar to a HTML table. So if you're familiar with HTML tables, you'll, you'll be roughly familiar with this. Um, see if I can find a quick example. Yeah, those are the shapes. So the HTML-like labels that you do a bit more stuff, uh, yeah. It just um, I had one the the org chart at work that it's like a two hundred k dot file, and it outputs to a ten meg PNG. I have seen some network diagrams done that use the HTML like table syntax very well. So you get a router with little squares for each port of the router and lines going from a port to another port. Oh, wow. So it is possible. Um, it's not going to look like a router, but certainly the, the functional information is there. I'm just looking for an easier solution. Just a solution. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, this is... It's not the prettiest, but it's very simple to scrape a network, uh, a, a switch, get the information out and express that in a way that draws a graph for you immediately. Was there another question over here somewhere? Yes, Neil? As far as I know, yeah. What were you thinking of? So dot is specifically for graphs, okay. but there are other declarative language for, for other things. Um, another one that I was tossing up talking about tonight is uh, Puppet, which is software for managing um, systems. Um, it has a declarative language. You say things like, there should be a file in this location. It should have this mode. It should have contents sourced from this location. And you, you declare the state of the system as you want it and Puppet will go through and make the system be that state. Um, Puppet's also useful for things like security audits because it, it gives you reports on this file has changed and it can show you before and after. And If you're running Puppet in a cron job, because you're asserting every half hour that the state of the system should be this, if you get a Puppet run that, where the state of the system is not that, you know that it's sometime within the last half, half hour that it changed. And you know that it's already fixed. 
Um, there are also uh, declarative languages used for things like artificial intelligence research. Um, there was a language called Prolog. It was popular like 40 years ago. this been done? <laughs> no. Yeah, it's apparently Gliffy is a, a plugin for Confluence, which is the wiki made by Atlassian, who make Jira, who I work for. Um, so I thought that might be what you're talking about, but apparently doesn't support dot. But yeah, it, virtually anything that draws, you know, things where you've got nodes that are connected by edges will be very similar because it's a graph. Um, Any other questions? Excellent. <laughs> if you're not made by it last week. Up next, Margarita. What I don't have is a working laptop. It'll come back soon. I've got to wait for Steve to make up his mind that I'm allowed to use it today. That's what you get for using non-free software. All right. For those who were here last week, uh, last month, um, I published an ebook on a walk I guided in Annandale in um, in April. Uh, I'm not sure why. I, well, basically, it was people from the National Trust, and they enjoyed it, so I got encouraged to publish it. And then that was 1890s Annandale, and then next year I'm going to do 1900 to 1910 Annandale. Um, so it's actually just winding up what I, what I spoke about. Um, so last month it was all about getting um, the HTML files into a zip um, package and uploading it to Lulu, so it's a self-published book. Um, and it was, it was passing all the formatting requirements for the EPUB. Um, then this month I've spent <laughs> the month trying to publish it to, to format the printed version from the EPUB. 
So the EPUB was just HTML files um, and the um, printed version to upload to Lulu has to be in a PDF. So um, the process I've used is to use OpenOffice and it's the, mas uh, it's the Open Office master document um, functionality you have um, and that lets you pull in the HTML files though the big challenge was to actually um, be able to do the formatting you wanted in in open office with with HTML source and I think that's been my big discovery so on the on the right hand side there you can see those are the HTML styles as open office see this them um, and on the left hand side those are the ones that I'm suggesting that I ended up using. So um, you use the P and that's a text body and so then you can define the characteristics of the text body, the font, the paragraph spacing, um, same with H1 to H6, um, soup which is um, um, superscript, that's the word I was looking for, um, block quote is another one that translated, um, an image image is fine. Um, I spent hours trying to figure out how you control the space around the image because OpenOffice doesn't recognise all the HTML tags so in the end I went up with a border and um, white border which is, is, is a bit of a hack um, and I used the H5 for the captions because again this is a problem where you actually want the captions in a different font so you can't use your standard paragraph. Um, so I used, yep, so I used that and so, so that, that, was, that was the main part about fiddling around with the format to get it out to an HTML file, adjusting the pages so you get page numbering generate and OpenOffice will generate the table of contents for you. Um, I've heard a few people mentioning LaTeX, so if anyone would like to give a talk on LaTeX um, next month, oh I won't be here next month, but I'd love to hear about LaTeX because that's something I haven't had a look at. Um, and then one last thing I'd like to say about doing the paperback is I got excited because in my EPUB I had lots of links going to the internet for to see images. So when it came to doing the paperback you sort of think that people are not going to have the ability to to click out and look at the web. So um, so what I actually went around is trying to get clearance for um, for the for the image for the third party images. I had lots of photographs but there's a lot of old photographs that are still around. And though they're out of copyright, various institutions have different policies and what they try and do is say, oh, if you're going to do a printed book, you need a high quality image and we're going to charge you a service fee for that. Um, and so there was a whole myriad of those to, I mean, the book is only six by nine, so the photos are really small and I said, well, the image on the internet is, is fine. So the National Library was the best. They said, yep, go ahead. You do have to ask permission and you have to ask permission for the pictures, but um, and but not maps. For some reason, maps are not covered. So they said, just go for it. If you find any maps, um, then that that's fine. Um, just use them. Um, so it's worth looking at the copyright information on on um, the National Library because if you're ever trying to do this information, you can pass it on to the other people, and they have to change their story from our oh, it's our copyright to <laughs> it's basically a service fee for the high quality. So the worst one was, I'll put the boot into the Historic Houses Trust. They said, oh no, you can't, you're not allowed to publish our photographs using a low quality image from our website. You have to purchase a high quality photograph. So, so there's a whole kind of range of attitudes. And the book is 1890s and a short walk and the paperback will be there soon. So any questions? It ha I haven't I haven't published it yet through Lulu. I've actually uploaded it, right. and then they give you a print ready copy, and I've fiddled with that again, <laughs> and 
So I'm not quite at that stage, but hope, hopefully it'll be happening in the next couple of days. Because you have to get to a point, I mean, like even just today, I went round to see someone who is a, sort of the local historian or who's been doing it for a long time, and I just thought, oh, I'll just get her to squeeze through it. And she gave me this big tip that um, John Young was the guy, original developer of Annandale, and I hadn't included that, so I went and revised the book yet again. So, um, yeah, so it's getting close. But, yes, then I will... You have to buy one copy at least. Yeah. So um, then it will get distributed. So there you go. OK. Thank you. Get a desktop. Yeah, this is a desktop. <laughs> <laughs> a desk note, I believe they call it. Still running Windows? Hell yes. <laughs> does does free, does free DOS count? <laughs> I'm just looking for uh, the port. I'm not used to hardware. <laughs> okay, so um, the previous speaker was asking about LaTeX, and I've recently learnt LaTeX for. Um, discrete mathematics that I'm learning at uni, so I thought I'd throw that in there as well. Just give me a second to configure this. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> Thank you. Oh, what is this? Oh, oh no! Oh no! Ah! Oh. So there's my little VMware with terrible resolution. What's the resolution you wanted? So, I can't really see it on this angle. What was it? <laughs> Tell me when to stop. Okay, I've been working on a few projects lately. Firefox is not my project, by the way. Um, <laughs> um, what do I have, Sarah? What do I have first? Data analytics. Um, recently, I got accepted into a into a unit at Mac I'm a student at Macquarie University. Recently, I got accepted into a unit that allows me to write a thesis on a research topic, a mini thesis. Um, so I'm doing a data analytics on PDF um, to extract the content, uh, uh, the table of contents information, and automatically link that to the page number um, and link it into a full like Google Reader scribe type interface. Um, and I'm going to be using, where is it? The, uh, I've got internet connection. Yes, no, no, maybe. Alt F4. It's okay, it's only to show my grandchildren. So um, I'm using the uh, WT C++ Web Toolkit, which is based off 
uh, well, which is uses the same type of language as Qt and and has rewritten quite a few of the libraries. So basically, if you've got a Qt application, which is like a, a GUI library, if you've got a Qt application, then you can easily port it to Wt, and, and Wt is the web. Qt is every other platform, pretty much. The iPhone port is still in alpha, though. Um, it's really fast. It allows you to develop everything in C++ or even Java <laughs> um, or Ruby even. Um, but yeah, it's really freaking fast. GPL, no, LGPL. It's an awesome toolkit, and I'm going to be using this to uh, write the server backend for the PDF reader type thing. Um, I main, I'm mainly using um, I, uh, iCATA information, uh, which is the Document Analysis Rec Recognition uh, Conference. There are quite a few of them. It's been going on since, I think, 2001. Um, and, and basically just seeing techniques that people have done in the past um, and seeing if I can leverage from their techniques to make my job easier. For instance, I found a, I found a small article. Oh, uh, out of time? No? Uh, I, um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I found a small article by Len et al. 2008, I forget the title, but it's about uh, structural analysis, and he got 100%, uh, almost 100% accuracy for header and footer recognition in PDFs, which is excellent. If you didn't know before, PDFs are really bad format for anything other than just looking at on the page with your eyes. So if you want to analyze it with, with anything, it's horrible. It is not XML. Um, <laughs> why? Um, design problem, really. You don't get a paragraph, you get a line of text. Streams of text. Yeah, it's format-based on what's around the um, One of these. There was um, an interesting article that um, incorporated control tab. Fuck off! <laughs> I hope this is recorded. <laughs> yeah, here we go. So, um, 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 <laughs> um, so basically, um, a few researchers have actually fixed the problem of PDF, and as you've all heard, OCD has now completely replaced PDF, and no one uses PDF anymore. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, We've all heard of it. So, which university are you with? I'm with um, Macquarie University. I'm just a student. Um, <laughs> what? Unicorns. Unicorns. Unicorn. <laughs> so, um, basically, because, because something like this won't, won't get into mainstream, we need to work with what we've got, and I'm going to fix up PDFs. Um, and that's my PDF talk crossed off, data analytics, WT. Um, I've recently been working with some CMSs such as uh, Drupal and I've also taken a look at Plone and a few others. Um, shameless plug for my one of my sites. I built an entire conference using only open source software, an entire co um, conference website. Um, all the features work on it. Um, a bit of messy PHP. Ugh, hate PHP, but since um, no one's developed it in WT, I've got to work with what I've got. So basically, the entire system works epically. Like, it's fast. The certificate works on the sites I wanted it to work on, AES 256. It is PHP, and I'm sorry that I have to use it. But um, the, PH, uh, the Python distribution for conferences is still in alpha, alpha stage. <laughs> so it's pretty much, it, it's past planning. It's used on a few conferences, but it hasn't incorporated ticketing. Um, but I heard a few people in the uh, Django project are working on something. So we'll, we'll hear soon. OK, what else do I have? The web portals. I recently found an interesting uh, uh, product called uPortal. It was originally developed at Yale University, the same people that brought us CAS, which is a great way to implement single sign-on, also open source. Uh, something to do with Java special interest group. Um, I currently have special interest in this web page loading. 
Um, <laughs> uh, uh, you, you portal is a great solution for your intranet. So if, if you're looking at building an intranet in your workplace or you're replacing one, uPortal is a thing for you. It's also got other great features. In fact, some universities use it for their entire system. Ex excellent thing there. Just take a look at the features. I, I literally only found this a couple of days ago. Um, it's perfect for whatever um, internet web portal type things you need, where, whether you're a business, education, or whatever. Um, help desk. I, I have been looking at GLPI, which is a great uh, product by a German company um, that incorporates like an inventory management system, really, w and it's really well done, and it, it also has ticketing, etc. But the inventory management system isn't built into the program. So if you want discovery, for instance, if you wanted to know what everything's running on your network, what versions of software, etc. Um, you, it, it's very difficult to, to figure out without using uh, specialized software. And this is free, open source, GPL version 2. Um, What's the language? I think that's also PHP, but it might be Perl. <laughs> um, I'll have to get back to you on that one. Um, and I can either use, ooh, I can either use, uh, I can either use uh, Fusion Inventory or OCSPI. I'm just trying to remember. Um, so I can either use this, which is is literally um, a plug-in for it, or I can use OCS, which is a complete other package that also has a plug-in into GLPI, so that inventory is managed and software deployment is also done cross-platform. It's a beautiful piece of software. Um, and in French? No, German. No, French. <laughs> Beyond view. Yeah, um, whatever. There we go. English. Give me English. Fuck, there we go. So this is done by a French company. GLPI is done by a German company. Don't ask me why. So, so basically, if, if you want like an inventory of all the hardware and software in your network, this is the product for you. Is this for storing the information or is this discovery? This, this, is, discover, um, this is discovery. Uh, storage is done also on, on this in its database, but, but I'd recommend that you link it with GLPI just because that's a much better, better method and you've got ticketing and things like that. So people could say, I'm from this computer and you've got, you can bring up all their information. Um, how does it do the discovery? How does it do the discovery? It, it has its own protocol, surprisingly enough. It, yeah, yeah, you have to install the agent on the machines. I'm currently working, I, I do a bit of package management as well. I'm actually currently working with the Wix libraries, which is not GPL, but common, common public license by Microsoft, the first thing they released under that license. And they released it on SourceForge a while ago, and I'm going to be using that to make an MSI for the OCS inventory agent. Um, what else do I have on that list? Remote Shell, I found a great tool called called Rundesk, I'm not sure if you've heard of it. So basically, if, if you want to run your scripts on all your servers in, on your network, Rundesk is the tool for you, free open source Ruby, I think? I don't know, it's from the same people that made Control Tier, which is another software deployment system. Um, Rundesk is great, so, so let's say you had a couple of scripts that you want to run on each machine, maybe incrementally, like maybe a um, cron job or something. Um, I actually wasn't. I actually didn't know I was going to <laughs> give a talk today. Someone told me this before. So Rundesk is on GitHub. Maybe I'll just do Rundesk to GitHub. I don't know. I, I found it when... <laughs> I'll give you a link to it later. <laughs> I definitely, it's definitely Rundesk. Anyway, well, <laughs> I'll find it later. And LaTeX. Unfortunately, I've been using Windows for my LaTeX stuff. There we go. Minimize Linux. 
like it should remain minimized. Yeah. No. <laughs> um, We're looking to find out where you live somehow. Yeah. I live on the interwebs. Yeah. Why do we need to punish him? He uses Windows. That's <laughs> so um, I actually I, I write up all my lectures in, um, in class in LaTeX. Um, it's a great tool. And when I can find my mouse, I'll show you tell you more about it. So here, so here is my here is my code. Um, very simple code. I'm trying to get better at it. For instance, here down the bottom, I, um, I've actually been on the Stack Overflow text thing because I realized that, um, that this isn't how you meant to code LaTeX. It just felt a bit messy. Um, here is the lecture, by the way. A bit of maths. Um, other other stuff I've got. Um, I've been drawing some Venn diagrams also in LaTeX. Uh, is this? No, that's the same lecture I got. Oh, no, here it is. So um, feel free to stop me anytime for questions. I'm not quite sure. <laughs> <laughs> Um, when you're writing it, yeah, like, um, I mean, this code is just beautiful. I mean, um, let me, sh what is this, lecture 14? <laughs> yep, so, 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 um, every, t every now and then to check my code, I compile my document. So LaTeX, you compile, so, or LaTeX, whatever you meant, whatever you meant to call it. Um, it's, it's a, Um, it probably wouldn't be the best tool for a spreadsheet. Ah, uh, lecture 16 was the one I was looking for. I mean, it really depends. But I mean, um, here's the lecture I was looking for. I know everyone loves seeing maths. Um, if you just scroll down a little bit. Um, where is it? Here. So I found some, some really neat ways of drawing Venn diagrams. So that's one Venn diagram, that's another Venn diagram, and this is another Venn diagram. So there's a cool thing called the even-odd rule um, that, al that allows you to, like for instance, um, this is separate, that's just um, showing what I'm doing. So that's um, whatever it is, complement of and here is what it gives me. Beautiful Venn diagrams. Wow. Yeah, and uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, and you asked before why you should use LaTeX for writing books because it's the industry standard. Well, I, I can export this as anything. No, that's what you're asking. Yeah, yeah. The exporting features of the. So, so. so yeah. File, save as. And you can and, and, and you can find all these sorts of 
like you find some add-ons online, you can load it into anything. There's a ridiculous number. Like I, this is just a base package. And it's already pretty decent, but um, you can do export to doc, ODT, HTML, XHTML. But you're coding in LaTeX. Yes. Which is up. Um, I'm giving you a position that up there with the evil empire of PDF. Um, <laughs> and whereas HTML is in fact the way. I mean, why would you code in LaTeX and not HTML? Is my question. So that you can have a consistent view in both. So that, that's compiling it. Someone asked me this before. Did I change something? So here we go. So the paperback. Yeah. Yeah, but, but I've already published the EPUB and that has been HTML. Um, yeah. Also with um, LaTeX, um, um, I know I showed you code, but you don't always need to write code. Like if, if you don't like code, for instance, when you're doing maths, you pretty much have to write code because otherwise you'd be going insert symbol from where and going through heaps of menus. But you can use things like this, which is basically looks like Word or LibreOffice or whatever. And, and it's a nice WYSIWYG, no, not WYSIWYG, whatever the other WYG. WYSIWYM, yeah, it's a nice WYSIWYM interface for LaTeX, and WYSIWYM is there. WYM, what you see is what you mean, yeah, not what you get. Um, I've been kind of rushed because I did this whole thing in five minutes, hopefully, maybe more. And hopefully you'll never touch it again. Okay. Hopefully you'll never touch it again. I have never touched it, and now I know why. <laughs> <laughs> so I chose the right way. Oh, well, good, good job, Samuel. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so it's good. Talk has been very useful. Thank you. Ah, uh, yeah. Well, um. Anything else? Are you done? <laughs> Can we go to the pub now? Some of us want to eat and drink. It was one of these. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's. Unless one of these pages loads, that's it. <laughs> so uh, thanks for your time. Thanks, Wait, wait, here it is. <laughs> Yay! So this is the thing I was talking about before. I got run desk mixed up with run deck. So basically, remote shell crap. It's awesome. Since everyone's in a rush to go, I'll tell you more at the pub. But it's freaking epic. Woo! Um, so as per usual, we're heading off to the Piedmont Bridge Hotel. Those who want to join us there.